Good morning, Vietnam. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Uh, welcome to It's Always Sunny in Hollywood, or I guess today it's always sunny in Vietnam. Shit, why didn't I come up with that bit beforehand? Whatever, <laughs> we'll make it work. Today, uh, Patrick will not be attending this episode. Um, I think it's a pretty funny coincidence that the last episode he didn't show up for was also when I talked about <laughs> a seminal film in a very important filmmaker's because the last time it wasn't here was The Departed, which also won like a billion Oscars and considered one of the best movies of all time. That was our second episode, and I think this is like, what, episode 17? Yeah, it's episode 17. Yes, it is. All right. So, yeah. Solid amount of episodes. Uh, Don't worry, guys. Patrick will be here uh, next week. He just had a family emergency. So, uh, let's... Why don't you introduce yourself, the other host? Oh, Hi. I'm Red. I'm Red Drumarts. Drumarts, whatever. Fuck it. Uh, and I'm uh, Lugia, and I'll do the best I can without uh, Patrick here. Okay, so um, uh, E3 was this week, but uh, we are going to talk about that in a special separate episode because so much E3 news happened, we figured it, it's enough to make up for another episode. Um, but there's still you know, other news we're going to briefly touch upon. Uh, the Disney show Loki started. So you, you watch Loki? No. Uh, this is another Marvel thing, and I'm not really into Marvel movies or shows. For the people that have watched the previous Marvel shows, I'd say out of the three, this one had the strongest first episode and is the one I'm most looking forward to now, which is, I think, interesting because this was a show that I went in with zero expectations because I thought it was going to suck. But uh, no, it's actually incredibly cool. Owen Wilson and Tom Hiddleston do some pretty damn good performances. And uh, I'm just a sucker for bureaucratic time police shit. That stuff was in like the Archie Sonic comics and yeah. Umbrella Academy. You know, the Zone Police. Zonic the Zone Cop. Yeah, this whole show is basically just about that, but like the Marvel's version of it. So apparently there are some behind-the-scenes stuff about Ghostbusters Afterlife came out. Uh, it seems to be directed by Jason Reitman, who is the son of Ivan Reitman, who directed the first movie. I think that's a very bizarre choice, personally, just because, uh, I don't know if you know it, but Jason Reitman is actually a very accomplished filmmaker on his own, but his movies are literally nothing like his dad's at all. Uh, to give an example, his most famous movie is Juno. Oh. Juno is nothing like Ghostbusters. I don't get it, but whatever. They I don't know, maybe just... he saw this as a chance to prove himself? I don't know. I mean, I think he already proved himself, being that, you know, he's won multiple Oscars, but whatever. <laughs> Apparently, they're advertising this a father-son thing, but I don't know. I think, if we're being real, Ghostbusters is Dan Aykroyd's baby. He was inspired by his love of the paranormal. He made it with a bunch of his best friends. I don't know. All right, in animation news, uh, they showed off the new He-Man show. That got a trailer. I think the animation looks incredibly impressive. I think that was made by the same animation studio as Castlevania. Yes, it is. Yeah, uh, that's why it looks so similar. Some people are a bit upset because um, it's taken such a drastically different direction from the She-Ra show, but the way I see it is, like, She-Ra show still exists. Like, so what? You know? Besides, apparently there's, they're actually making two He-Man reboots, so the second one might be more in line with that universe. Uh, they also finally showed the trailer for the Cuphead TV show. You see that? No, but I'm actually really excited that it's getting a show. Yeah, I saw the animation, and while it's not quite as tight as the, um, the actual game, uh, it's pretty damn good. Wayne Brady is playing, uh, the dice guy. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, his voice, it fit perfectly. I was like, damn, that's excellent. Um, you've played Cuphead, right? No, I've seen a lot of people play Cuphead, though, and I'm just enamored yeah. by the visuals and music. It's a very fun game. I'd recommend it. Uh, if you like, it's very inspired by Genesis, actually, the Genesis games, you know, yeah. the Star Heroes and stuff. Since we're talking about Castlevania, Netflix is making a Richter Belmont show. They ended the, the Trevor Belmont, I guess, saga, and now they're moving on to Richter Belmont, which is pretty cool. They're skipping, like, three Belmonts by going to Richter. <laughs> the game skipped a lot of Belmonts. I mean, like, there was a pretty big gap between yeah, but no, Trevor and Simon, Specifically, too. they're skipping Simon. Yeah, I know. Um, Who knows? They might backpedal to Simon eventually. I don't think this is going to be like JoJo, where it's just constantly, chronologically moving forward. 
they're apparently making a Velma show that has nothing to do with Scooby Doo. As in, like, none of the Scooby Doo characters are there except Velma. And a lot of people are, like, confused and upset. And um, I guess my theory about what's going on is that they just pitched around this show. Nobody said yes. So they're like, all right, what if we just attach some IP to it and then it'll get picked up? And I guess their plan worked. Uh, personally, I would have picked, like, Daria or something instead of Scooby Doo. Anyway, more lighthearted news. Uh, DC recently announced that Batman doesn't eat pussy. Sorry, what? So in the new Harley Quinn show, there was going to be a scene where um, Batman eats uh, Catwoman out, and then DC specifically told him to remove the scene because Batman doesn't do that. They specifically said that's not what heroes do. And my hero's like, what? <laughs> what the hell? Okay. <laughs> that's such a weird lower thing to add. Yeah, Batman says me. And oh, there are so many memes like last few days. Even I like got in on it a couple times. I, I I made like a list of like, you know what? I would argue that because there's so many different Batmans that some of them do and some of them don't. I was like, like Michael Keaton, he definitely does. George Clooney, that Batman definitely does. But like Christian Bale, he doesn't do it at all. Uh-uh. Conroy doesn't do it, but he except in Mask of the Phantasm. Like that's that one movie. That's the only time he does it. Yeah, this is, I find it incredibly funny. Like DC felt the need to like they like literally just saying our superheroes don't. He doesn't eat ass, people. They don't have oral sex. I'm like, all right, what a strange thing to know now. That's canon, I guess. Anyway, last news is they uh, finally showed off the animated teaser for Uzumaki. The uh, adaptation, the anime adaptation of Junji Ito's most famous work. You ever read Junji Ito? No. But you should. He's a good horror manga writer. Anyway, uh, that's it for the news. Uh, today's movie is Apocalypse Now, if you couldn't tell by all the Vietnam stuff I talked about in the, morning, in the intro. Although I, I did technically reference two Vietnam movies, because I also referenced Good Morning Vietnam, but like that has nothing to do with Apocalypse Now. It's just something else. Apocalypse Now, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. If you don't know about this movie, have you been living under a fucking rock? This is like, if you ask most filmmakers or film critics what the top 10 best movies of all time are, this movie would definitely be up there. It's considered Coppola's like masterpiece after The Godfather. And The Godfather's already, you know, considered the best movie of all time. So. I've not seen that, surprisingly. I know, not... I need to get on watching The Godfather, but... I was planning on recommending the third one for the tril- uh, for the podcast, and I thought it'd be funny if, like, you guys didn't actually see the first two and just went into the third one blind. <laughs> but yeah, that's probably not a good idea. So this movie was nominated for eight Oscars, I think, uh, and actually won a good deal of them. Actually, let me double check. How many did it win? forgot to mention this is a double feature we also watched the uh documentary hearts of darkness which is about the behind the scenes so um we'll get more into i guess the background of the movie there i guess just a few more tidbits is that this is based off the novel heart of darkness by joseph conrad apparently the video game spec ops the line was also inspired by it so i don't know maybe play that game i heard mixed things about it and Coppola, after the fact, made multiple recuts of the movie, but uh, most people, including me, agree that the theatrical cut is the best version. And that's Which also is the what version... we watched. Yeah, that's the version we watched for this uh, episode. What did they add, though? I'm curious. Um, there's just one scene where... Uh... Okay, so this movie is also, I'd say, loosely inspired by the Odyssey. There's a scene that's meant to like mimic the sirens in the Odyssey, um, and but instead of, like, actual sirens or uh, Playboy bunnies. Oh, I um, saw that part. Never mind. How long, wait, what, how long was the movie you saw? Two and a half hours. I, I'm pretty sure I sent you the theatrical cut. Wait, let me, let me double check this now. Wait. Uh, what, let me actually look at what added. The Redex cut, standard version, 49 additional scenes. So, yeah, the Redex cut is, like, three hours long. Okay, so maybe it wasn't the Playboy. What got added then? I know the, um, you know how the movie opens with the This is the End by the Doors, that song? Yeah. I know in the, um, Redux cut, or maybe the final cut, they have that song go on for, like, the entire length. 
And if you haven't heard that song before, it's a long fucking song. It's like longer than Bohemian Rhapsody. It's insane. It's like 10 minutes. No, I'm pretty sure you sent me the theatrical cut. I know I sent you the theatrical cut, but I'm, I'm just... Now I'm trying to remember what's the difference. I think maybe some of the scenes are just extended. I thought that when I saw the Redux cut or the final cut, I thought like the pacing was pretty damn bad. Also, yeah, the door song is like it's 12 minutes long. So um, yeah, it was I, nowhere near as long. You didn't, you didn't when listen I saw to it. 12 minutes. Okay, yeah. Oh, there was this. Okay, there was a second encounter with the playmates. So yeah, that's what I was thinking of. The so they just added and... scenes for the sake of adding runtime. I don't know what the motivation behind the uh, other cuts are. I don't know, pe maybe people are just curious and it's like, eh, fuck it. Why not? The more um, the merrier. But yeah, no, they added this thing called the French plantation scene, which is what I was thinking of. And uh, the playmates are there too. I know the playmates are in the theatrical version, but that's... My mind just got a bit befuddled. So, I guess we should just get into the uh, swing of things. So, oh, wait, let me just, the awards briefly. Um, so it won the Oscar for Best Cinematography and Best Sound, but it was nominated for, you know, everything else. You know, Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Director, Best Writing. Apocalypse Now won the Palme d'Or, which is the highest honor in film, higher than the Oscars. We've talked about a Palme d'Or winner before. It was uh, Pulp Fiction, so obviously it's, Movies that won the Palme d'Or, those are really, like, culturally significant. We're dealing with high art here. Yep. It lost the Oscar to Kramer vs. Kramer, which is actually a pretty damn good movie, but, uh, huh. Kind of funny in retrospect that Kramer vs. Kramer won Best Picture over Apocalypse Now. So anyway, uh, let's briefly talk about the cast. You will recognize a lot of these cast members. This was, again... Francis Ford Coppola after the two Godfather movies, so he was high demand. Everyone wanted to work with him. He was a millionaire. But uh, let's see. Marlon Brando played Colonel Walter E. Kurtz. He is, I guess, the main villain of the movie. The main character is Martin Sheen, who uh, plays, um, what's his name? Benjamin Willard. I the, think so. Whole I'll be honest. Whole I do not remember the characters' names at all. Yeah, the movie is basically about... Um, Colonel uh, Kurtz, he basically went rogue, and uh, the whole plot is about Benjamin Willard basically going out to terminate Kurtz with extreme prejudice. That's uh, one of the famous quotes from the movie. And uh, some other actors you might know, Robert Duvall, he's actually famous for The Godfather along with Brando. Um, so Robert Duvall, he played Colonel Bill Kilgore. There's also Lawrence Fishburne, a young Lawrence Fishburne in this movie. Also Harrison Ford. So this, this was 79. This was actually after Star Wars. So, okay. Uh, Dennis Hopper was in this movie. So just lots of famous people. You all, you'll recognize a lot of them. Shit, some of them probably got famous because of this movie for talking about it. I mean, this is young <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne. So as far as we know, this is Lawrence Fishburne's big break. Oh yeah, yeah. This was this was definitely Lawrence Fishburne's big break. He was he had like no credits before this. So yeah, this movie is episodic in structure. So giving the plots kind of just might be kind of ruining it almost. But basically, just there's a bunch of different sequences, and then um, I guess the big critical sequence is the last act is when you finally get to meet Brando's character that's been um built up this whole time. And his performance is fucking insane. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, honestly. Before then, oh. it kind of just feels like a wild goose chase, which is a very boring way of describing it, but that's kind of what it is. Yeah. This whole movie, I think this movie's fantastic. I found it constantly engaging, but like it also has a lot of moody psychological elements, lots of cross dissolves and musical needle drops, I guess that's the word. And as the movie goes on, it just gets a bit more and more insane, like falling into madness, and the ending is just bad shit. Yeah, I think the ending is probably this movie's strong suit. Yeah, like, talk about sticking a landing, good lord. The visuals are... This movie, when I watched the first time, it almost felt kind of surreal, because, like, it, this movie's so iconic. You've seen it re done over and over again in other movies before. Same, same thing happened with Pulp Fiction, but this one's more of, like, this movie is so ingrained in the language of Vietnam, like when that um, 
the uh, Ride of the Valkyries, that bum ba da bum bum yeah. bum da bum bum. I have seen that parody so many times; it's ridiculous. And it started in this movie. Yes, this was the movie that did it. I didn't this was the know first that. One. Yeah, it's kind of like um, I don't know. It's kind of like Fortunate Son, like how every like everyone associates Vietnam with Fortunate Son, like everyone associates Vietnam with Apocalypse Now. It's crazy. Like even even Kubrick is someone in the shadow of this movie a little bit. So yeah, lots of elements of the Odyssey in there. I already mentioned the sirens earlier, but uh, Coppola also mentioned he. Uh, which character did he say was a Cyclops? He sent mentioned. Um, I don't remember. Like there wasn't like an actual Cyclops, but uh, he said metaphorically, you know, there was a scene reminiscent of the Cyclops in um the Odyssey. It's a very difficult movie to discuss just because it's not particularly traditional. It's not like you can just go through the plot and then talk. It's kind of like the bit. wall where everything is wrapped around yeah. symbolism. Yeah, this this definitely feels I mean, it's like engaging, a good companion but it's not something that you can easily discuss. I feel like this, yeah, the, the comparison to the wall is good. This movie even gave me kind of a Pink Floyd vibe, even though I don't think any Pink Floyd music played. The beginning certainly um, reminded me a lot of the wall with the music sequence and the psychedelic imagery. Performances were great. I'm surprised Especially, they got Harrison Ford in on this, and he was only in like one scene. The thing is, like, this was Harrison Ford pretty young in his career, and also, again, it's Coppola, and two, uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but George Lucas and Coppola are, like, incredibly close friends. Yeah. They worked at the same company. I mean, you saw him in the documentary, right? Yeah. Yeah, George Lucas was, so, makes sense, I guess. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. It's like, this movie's all inspiring and it's had a budget of, like, $30 million, which I'm sure, like, with, um... It's a lot of money, but... Actually, let me look up inflation. All right, so this probably would have been like $100 million in today's budget, actually. But you can see the money on screen, because this movie feels huge. And then they made it huger, and people didn't like that. All right, well, you still need to have good <laughs> pacing. I would honestly argue this might be the best movie on we've seen on the podcast. Uh... I'm not sure if it's my favorite. I think I might like Pulp Fiction a bit more, but like, in terms of quality, this might be better than Pulp Fiction, honestly. That's kind yeah, of more hard for me to say personally, because I've seen movies like this before. This wasn't really anything new to me. It was good. I enjoyed my time with it. I'd probably give it like an 8 out of 10, but I don't think it was like super groundbreaking. See, that's Especially when it comes you're... to the whole war is hell theme. Well, that's the thing, though. It's like you're viewing this from the perspective of like... um all the movies that were inspired by it, but yeah. uh, a lot of what you think isn't groundbreaking. This was the first movie to do it. I know, it's just kind of hard to see it from that perspective when you've seen movies similar to it before. Yeah, that's fair enough. There's a lot of I Vietnam say, movies. as I think Pulp Fiction is the best movie that we've seen, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd rank Pulp War Fiction movies aren't necessarily my forte. Yeah, I, I'd rank Pulp Fiction higher than this, but I'd say this is a solid like second place. I'd say like Definitely a 10 out of 10 for me, at least. Now, so Hearts of Darkness, help... I'd say I was probably more interested in. Yeah, Hearts of Darkness. Because, Dark is... holy shit. Yeah. Definitely much more engaging than... If I was going to compare it to, I guess, Disasters, which is the other behind-the-scenes thing, we've seen, yeah, this is much more compelling than Disaster Artist. Like, good Disaster Lord. Artist just wanted to tell a story. This just wanted to tell you, hey, we made a movie, and it kind of got fucky. Hearts of Darkness feels like what Tropic Thunder was like a parody of. Because Tropic Thunder is about a movie that, that takes place in like Vietnam. It's just, everything's just fucked up. Everything just goes wrong. People die and shit. But yeah, this... Jesus Christ. Uh... I mean, it's one thing to be filming in unfamiliar territory because they did shoot this in Vietnam. It's another thing to think that you could film in the middle of a typhoon that killed over like 200 people. Yeah, and like Marlon Brando is... Brando's insane. I mean, I know you gotta meet deadlines, but I I feel like safety should be priority number one. You got Martin Sheen, who like had like a heart attack and like busted open his like hand during the scene. Yeah, and Coppola's like, uh, what heart attack? I think like Ma Martin Sheen and Coppola definitely they were going insane during the filming of this movie. Yeah, they, they completely lost it. Like you see Coppola writing this shit, and was like, oh, what the fuck is going on? 
it, it, it's it's kind of comedic almost like in a dark comedy sort of way but it's like at least it reaches a point where you question like if all this is ethical or legal for that matter you want to man talk... had to do speed and acid yeah I mean, just I to guess... make sure he was like giving the right tone for his character you know, what's fucked up is that this is even like one of the worst disasters that happened in like film like uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Twilight Zone, the movie, but, like, that movie actually got people killed. Like, the yeah. zone got to go to trial. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, that's some fucked up shit that happened back then in movies. Lots of disasters. At least with this one, it, it actually kind of turned out okay. Like, I mean, like, not okay. It turned out great, but, like... The process of getting there so... was a completely different experience. Yeah. It turns out so great that... You could almost think they almost felt like it was worth it, but like Jesus, yeah, the Lord. shit they had to go through. Yeah, I mean it's a damn good thing it was great. Imagine this movie turned out like crap, and they're like, "All oh, this shit I went do, through." Do you know nothing. what Coppola would have done if this movie sucked? I mean, I, I'm not even sure he does like the movie because he has made two cuts of it since. I don't know, maybe just change his mind on like some stuff, but um, yeah, it's something. And he spent his own money too. Like he, I think he spent like thirteen million dollars of did, his own cash. Yeah, he did this out of pocket. The studio, because they really wanted like Zoetrope to become independent. Unfortunately for Zoetrope, uh, Coppola made this movie called One from the Heart that completely bombed and fucked them over. But um, valiant effort on his part, you know, made three of the best movies of all time. Just trying to four of the best movies of all time. Actually, the conversation is great too. Out of curiosity, have you seen any of Coppola's other movies? Uh, Those well, I haven't seen one. The Godfather. I'm actually gonna look that up right now. Um, I've seen seven of his movies. I saw The Godfather trilogy, of course. But um, there's also The Outsiders. You ever watched The Outsiders? I might have. Tony Boy. I know I've read the book. I might have seen the movie too. Yeah, I think I saw the movie in middle school in class. So, and we went to the same middle school. So actually, you probably saw it too. Yeah. I guess aside from Apocalypse Now, uh, no, or like except for maybe The Outsiders. I recommend this movie. Peggy Sue got married. It has Jim Carrey and uh, Nick Cage in it, and like this is like early in their career, and it's like, I don't, I think that may be the first time you get to see Nick Cage and Jim Carrey in their prime in a movie together. It's insane. Um, and the plot's kind of like I don't know, Back to the Future. Okay. A uh, lady gets sent back in time. It's pretty good. Um, also The Conversation, which actually came out the same year as The Godfather Part 2, and was also nominated for a billion Oscars. Like, that is insane. This man put out one of the best movies of all time, and then that same year, put out one of the best movies of all time. <laughs> He's just kind of firing in all cylinders there. Yeah, like, I know Spielberg released Jurassic Park and, like, Schindler's List the same year. Like, this is, some of these directors, they're, they are something else. Good lord. Uh, then you got Tarantino released like one movie once, maybe every three to five years. Coward, pussy, fuck you, Tarantino. <laughs> nah, I'm kidding. So, uh, final thoughts? Uh, I guess this movie a uh, nine out of ten. I ranking wise, uh, definitely the top five. Still put it pretty highly up. Maybe right below the wall. I'd say right below the wall, right above Memento. I think Hearts of Darkness helped me appreciate how much work went into Apocalypse Now. I still think the movie is overall really good, but Hearts of Darkness made me realize that there was a lot of passion put into this project. They went through fucking hell and back just to get this baby running, but... Uh, there's a lot of people that actually like this documentary more than the actual movie. I can see why. Yeah, the documentary helped shed light on certain aspects of the movie. So, um... I guess, what would you overall give Hearts of Darkness? I'd probably say 8 out of 10, same as Apocalypse Now. Yeah. It's definitely on the higher end of the tier list for me. I'd probably put them both, like, right next to each other in, like, the same spot. So, yeah. Fantastic movie. Definitely check it out. If you like uh, Apocalypse Now, some movies you can also check out is... A Aguirre, The Wrath of God by Werner Herzog. This movie actually inspired... Um, Coppola, so you can say this was the precursor to Apocalypse Now. There's also the movie Sorcerer by, um, actually, who directed Sorcerer? 
Uh, I really I have not seen Aguirre the Heartless, but I have seen Sorcerer it came out in 1977, so actually before Apocalypse Now. And um, by William Friedkin, it's a fantastic movie. Uh, also, I went through similar production troubles, so uh, yeah, maybe fellas, maybe you should have learned your lesson from that. But I don't know if you never learned your lesson, you never get the movie. So whatever. Also, check out Platoon. I think it's also about Vietnam. And it's got Will Defoe Jacket. in it. Yep. It's also uh, Full Metal Jacket, which is, in my opinion, it's actually one of my favorite war movies ever. The first half is so fresh, unique, you never seen another war movie before. Second half is a bit more traditional, but still pretty damn good. It ends on a really good note, too. Yeah. Uh, you've seen Full Metal Jacket, right? I have, yeah. I'd say it's also my yeah. favorite war movie. Yeah. Then there's also The Deer Hunter, which was a movie... But actually, uh, was the first movie to really utilize uh, the Oscars as an advertising thing. Because um, Deer Hunter is an insane movie. We, we might actually have to talk about that on the podcast one day. I um, also recommend Thin Red Line by Terrence Malick. That's about World War II, but I still feel it has enough of Apocalypse Now's DNA in it that a lot of people appreciate it. Then there's Kong Skull Island. I know you're thinking, what the fuck does a King Kong Godzilla movie have to do with um, Apocalypse Now? But uh, this movie actually takes place in Vietnam and was actually inspired by Apocalypse Now. You can even see it on the poster that it looks exactly like Apocalypse Now. Um, bizarre choice and all. It's also First Reform, Jacob's Ladder, Taxi Driver... Uh, all those kind of have a similar descent into madness thing Apocalypse Now has going on. Then there's The Lost City of Z. I have not seen this movie, but people told me it's similar to Apocalypse Now. And also Ad Astra, which people told me is Apocalypse Now, but in space. Have not seen those movies, though. Although that does remind me, Ad Astra, a lot of people complained about the narration of that movie. But uh, I felt the narration in this movie really added to it. Uh, I cannot say from experience. I've never seen the movie. I'm not talking about Ad Astra, I'm talking about this movie. Oh. What'd you think about the narration? It helped set the tone. I wouldn't say it was, like, outstanding or anything, but it helped set the tone for the movie. Yeah. I know a lot of people, like, shit on narration, but I don't know, man. Coppola and Scorsese, like, two of the best filmmakers ever, they use it a lot. I don't know, just saying. Maybe narration isn't that bad, and you just suck. Listen, as long as you got Morgan Freeman, you're all good. Otherwise, yep. you gotta try. And um, I mentioned this earlier, but the video game Spec Ops The Line, people tell me it's good. I also have many people tell me it's awful. So I don't know. Play it and find out for yourself. I've never played it. I might one day. I'm not actually a big fan of military shooters. The only FPS I'm really a fan of is Half-Life and Doom. Maybe Halo. I've played that once at a friend's place. Okay. So that one on a weird tangent. Um, Lugia, what's your recommendation for next week? Alright, so I gave this a little bit of thought. It is going to be yet another video game movie. Why? Because, actually, this is for a friend. Um, and I feel like we might have a couple of things to say about it. Alright. So, you want to take Mortal a guess, Com or should I just say it? No, I'll take a guess. Mortal Kombat? No. Sonic? No. Detective Pikachu? Nope. Three strikes. The movie that we are going to see next week is 1994's Street Fighter the Movie. Ah, uh, that was close to Mortal Kombat. Yeah, you yeah. almost had it. Yeah, because I was thinking about the W.S. Anderson Mortal Kombat. I was like, is he going to do another W.S. Anderson movie? All right, Street Fighter. Raul Julia's final Last performance. performance. Yes. And I, an iconic one. People think this movie sucks, but they still like him in this movie. But we will directed get to that him. when we get to that. Yes. Directed and written by Stephen E. D'Souza, who also wrote... Shit, he wrote a... Damn. He actually wrote a lot of good movies. What the fuck? He wrote the screenplay for Die Hard 1 and 2. And granted, Die Hard was based off of a book, but, you know, still... Did he direct anything? Oh, no. No, Street Fighter was his only theatrical movie. Yeah, okay. I guess the studio's like, yeah, we're never letting you touch a film again. All right, next week is Street Fighter, the movie. 
the video game. They made a the video movie. game on the movie. <laughs> yes, they did. God may never let us know peace. Well, I guess it's time to terminate this podcast with extreme prejudice.